This is the beginning of a series of podcasts about the Russia-Ukraine crisis. I'm Jay Rogers. I'm the founder of Media House International and the director of The Forerunner. You can see our articles on forerunner.com about the recent uh, events, what's really happening in Kyiv, Ukraine, understanding the Ukraine crisis, how should Christians view Russia and Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis facts versus the lies, is the Russian invasion of Ukraine imminent? It turns out it was, um, but that's not what the article is about. And then I have a couple of articles from a Ukrainian Christian's point of view. And it's very different from what the, the view is of Ukrainian nationalists and what you see in the media. In order to understand this crisis, people need to understand some history behind the two nations, Russia and Ukraine. Most people don't realize it, but Ukraine is actually Mother Russia. Uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and specifically was called Kievan Rus. And if you want to go all the way to the beginning of Russian Christian history, you have to go back to the first century. Uh, the Apostle Andrew was actually an apostle to the Scythians, who are a tribal people. They were not Slavic people, but they were people that were um, lived above the Caucasus Mountains, around the Black Sea area. And there's an early Christian legend that says it was the Apostle Andrew who first preached in the region of Scythia on a missionary journey. He, was, he stopped on his way up the Dnieper River, and he planted a flag on its shore, and prophesied that one day a great city would arise in this place. And so the city of Kiev arose in this spot as early as the 5th century, and by the 10th century they had become a Christian nation. Now the Slavs formed the nucleus of a Russian population. They emigrated to Russia from the neighboring Carpathian Mountains. And from the earliest period from which we have any record of them, they're known as a free people, and they were mixed in with some Finns and Hungarians. Fin the finno ugric group were um, this nomadic group of people in this area. And in the ninth century, the Dnieper, with its many tributaries, formed the boundary of Slavonic settlements to the east. On the north, they reached the Valde Plateau and a great lake region. In the west and south, they touched the German settlements, the Germanic people, who not, not Germany today, but the the Germanic people who originally came from the east, also the Goths were in that area too. And then on the southwest, they were bordered by the Byzantine Empire. Um, in the middle of the ninth century, you find them split up into numerous tribes on the soil and engaged chiefly in hunting and agriculture. Uh, these were a continental people. They didn't have any mil military organization. And there was endless warfare between the tribes, but they were able to resist the inroads of invaders, the Vikings, the Mongols and the Turks, who now pressed them from the north, south, and east in the Middle Ages. So the foundation of the Russian Empire came, it was the invasion of the Vikings or the Northmen. Uh, they forced a union of these northwestern Rus Russian principalities, and this became known as Kievan Rus. This was under a uh, Scandinavian chief named Rurik, so it was actually a uh, Viking chieftain that came down from Scandinavia. And the Slavs and the Finns of northwestern Russia came to have great respect for the bravery and power of the Scandinavians. And they finally decided, let's call them to our aid. Uh, this would protect us from the crueler invasions of Mongols and Turks. Our land is great and has strength and abundance, but it lacks order and justice. Come and take possession and rule over us. So the first Russian rulers were actually Vikings. In response to this invitation, Rurik gathered together his kindred and a company of armed followers and established himself on the northern frontier of the Slavs. He soon became very powerful about the year 862 and made Novgorod about 100 miles south of the present St. Petersburg, the capital of an empire stretching from the lakes in the north to the sources of the Dnieper in the south. So right around from Kievan Rus all the way up towards 100 miles south of St. Petersburg. In the meantime, there were two other Viking chiefs by the name of Oskold and Deer. The first date in Russian history is the year 865, during which Askold led an expedition against Byzantium. Although successful, Askold's fleet was destroyed in the area of Marmora, and these barbarians attributed the disaster to the efficacy of the prayers of the Christians. So, as a result, Askold and many of his followers embraced Christianity, and they became believers. And so the following year, the, the church was established at Kiev. So the death of Rurik, who was the first great 
uh, Viking chieftain that ruled over the Slavs occurred in 879, and he was succeeded by the oldest member of his family named Oleg. Uh, this, this ruler conquered the eastern Slavs. He put Askold and Deer out of the way by an act of treachery. So they were the rulers of Kiev. So there is this great Byzantine city to the south called Byzantium or Constantinople. And now that was the goal of the Russian monarchs. In 907, Oleg reached the gates of Constantinople and he obliged the emperor to pay a large ransom for the city and agreed to a treaty of free commerce between the Russians and Greeks. So the king is descended from Rurik gradually consolidated the monarchy, which was designed, destined to become one of the foremost powers of Europe. The state came to be known as Russia from the word Ratsi, which was a name given by the Finns to the Norse conquerors. Um, in 988, Vladimir I adopted the Greek Orthodox Church as the official state religion. He ordered that churches and priests be established in all the towns, that the people be baptized, and thousands of people form lines at the river Dnieper and were baptized en masse. If a king becomes a Christian, whether it's genuine or not, and he brings the church there, whether it's genuine or not, and they're preaching the gospel, they're reading from the gospel, that's when evangelism begins. It's not the end of evangelism, but it's the beginning. So even though this was a forced Christianization of Russia, it was very beneficial to the progress of the society in general. And from this time on, monks from Byzantium and architects came from uh, Germany, Italy, Greece. So they're even like Roman Catholic, uh, or at that time what were uh, Western Catholic uh, priests came into the area and they spread languages and customs and ideas of the Christian nations of the East and West. So it became kind of like a more of a cosmopolitan culture. Um, somewhere around that time, there were two monks. One of them was named Kirill, which we get the uh, name Cyrillic from. They actually put the Slavic languages into Cyrillic alphabet. They invented an alphabet and were able to translate the Bible. So they translated the Bible. So they brought their culture to these fierce tribes of the north until by the 11th century the Russians were on the same level of civilization as the people of Western Europe. So they went in a very short period of time over a period of about 100 years from being this loose confederation of illiterate tribes to this thriving uh, culture. And that lasted to about the 13th century, okay, maybe like two, 300 years later. At this time, um, they were invaded by the Tatars, or the, the Mon they were the uh, Western version of the Mongolian Empire, and they overran the land. And for more than 200 years, the Tatars held the Russian princes in a degrading bondage. They for forced them to pay tribute, and they inflicted the most horrible atrocities on the people. So the Tatars are hated in Russia even till today. So Russia was cut off from the rest of Europe, and civilization and nationalization of the Slavs was delayed until the 15th century. In 1301, so the very beginning of the 14th century, this is the beginning of like the Italian Renaissance and all of that, um, the government of Kiev moved to Muscovy or Moscow. First they're in Vladimir, and then when Vladimir was attacked by the Tatars, they moved to Moscow, and they built, built these concentric rings around the city. That's why when you look at a map of Moscow today, you see it's all in ring shape. There were like walls that they kept expanding outward as the population grew. So 10 years after Moscow was uh, founded, the sea of the Orthodox Church followed. And so this was the foundation of Tsarist Russia. Moscow was fortified as a protection against the Tatars. The city gradually enlarged. The Kremlin was built and Moscow gained economic control over the surrounding principalities. So the story is Russia began in what is now modern day Kiev in Ukraine and was forced to move north as the Tatars took over Ukraine. Okay, what we know now as Ukraine. In the 16th century, there was a Tsar named Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Great, also known to us as Ivan the Terrible. Russians look at you strange when you call him terrible because he's considered great over there. He was the first emperor of Russia. He saw himself as a new Caesar. That's where the word Tsar comes from, is Caesar in Russian and he promoted a system of peasants and nobles. So for about, from the 16th century on to the 20th century, the vast majority of Russians were slaves. They could be bought and sold as workers. And the rest of Europe was moving into the Renaissance, as I said, the Reformation, the Age of Discovery. The czars were establishing, they were still establishing medieval feudalism as a way of life. The West is kind of moving out of feudalism around 
you know, the 1600s, 1700s, and Russia is moving into it. So the next hundred years are civil wars, peasant uprisings, foreign invasions, treacheries, um, the Jews were treated horribly, so on. So in the 17th century, the Romanovs founded a dynasty that ruled Russia for the next 300 years, up until the Russian Revolution, where the Romanovs, it's this dynasty in Russia. So the Tsar's power increased dramatically, local governments weakened, the Orthodox Church was exploited to fix the status of peasants. Like I said, they became slaves. She could buy us. I have a friend um, in Russia, and she uh, told me that her uh, she was descended from a Russian slave. Like her, her ancestors were being bought and sold, just like you know African Americans in our country were, were bought and sold as slaves. So Russia began to expand during this time. Siberia was settled, and that became part of Russia. Under the Romanovs, the Tsar's power increased dramatically. So the most powerful one was Peter the Great. He was ruled from 1689 to 1725. Peter was determined to open the window to Western ideas and brought tradesmen from Europe to Russia to train his people. He fought a war against Sweden. He incorporated Karelia, Finland, Estonia, and Livonia into his empire. Livonia would be like modern day Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, the city of St. Petersburg was founded and southern acquisitions were taken after a war with Persia. But even with all the land acquisitions and enlightenment that was coming into Russia, the peasants remained cruelly oppressed. Catherine the Great, Alexander I, they continued to expand the empire during their reigns. And then by the 19th century, the Russian empire included part of Poland and stretched all the way to Alaska. People, people forget about that, but Russia owned Alaska at one point. Uh, and down, Alaska stretched all the way down to the northern California coast. So this was a huge empire never before seen in the history of the world. Uh, they'd resisted Napoleon, but the unrest among the peasants mounted, and many of Russia's young aristocrats plotted to overthrow the government. So Nicholas I succeeded Alexander, and he was frightened by an attempted coup, in the early years of his reign, he began one of the most repressive regimes in Russian history. This was the 19th century, the 1800s. And so ironically, during this great period of oppression, this was also the great era of learning and art. There were these great authors like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, Pushkin, Gogol. Uh, the composer Tchaikovsky emerged during this time, and others. Dostoevsky prophetically warned his nation against the consequences of atheistic thinking. He was put into prison in a gulag, and he became a Christian. So he warned the Russian intellectuals, if there is no God, then everything is permissible. And that's a paraphrase. I talked to someone um, in Russia about this, because there are some atheists that say that he never said that. But I was talking to a uh, a woman who's a good friend of mine, who's a history and literature major, and she was saying that that's a paraphrase what he says throughout the book. It's not a direct quote, but that's how we usually take it, is if there is no God, then everything is permissible. Nicholas was followed by his son, Alexander II, who began a great reform of the system his ancestors created. So he became, he became known as the Tsar Liberator. He survived many assassination attempts by radicals who wanted either socialism or anarchy. In 1881, the revolutionaries assassinated him. If he'd lived longer, Russia may have entered the 20th century as a democratic Republican society, much like America. There's actually a lot of similarities between Russia and America during this time period. We had slaves, they had slaves. Um, they expanded west eastward, we expanded westward, and so on. But they may have been, they may have become a society like America if Nicholas had lived longer. He may have, you know, we don't know, it's speculation on my part, but that's what I think. Um, Alexander III was the, his successor. He relied on the army and established the secret police. And the secret police was the forerunner of what we know today as the KGB. And they quelled further uprising. He also made the Jews scapegoats for his father's murder. He forced them to live in certain provinces. So these were the Jewish ghettos in Russia, and he also subjected them to periodic pogroms. There was these organized massacres of Jews to keep them from overpopulating. So during this time, many Jews immigrated to the United States, and he also turned back on his father's reform. So it was a great tragedy 
that the reforms of Alexander II were overturned by Alexander III. This was at the end of the 1800s, and you can probably guess what happened from there. The last of the czars, uh, the, the collapse of the imperial regime came in the early 20th century. Tsar Nicholas II was a very weak ruler who faced serious political and economic problems during his reign and suffered an unexpected defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. And then on January 22, 1905, a large crowd of peasants followed a priest into the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg to present a petition to the Tsar. As the palace troops fired into the crowd, killing several hundred people. Um, this incident is known as Bloody Sunday and it spurred a workers' strike which paralyzed the faltering nation. Tsar Nicholas granted a constitution which gave voting rights, freedom of the press and assembly of the people, a legislative body called the Duma, which is a, which is a house. It's, in Moscow, it's called the White House because it's white, but it's the Duma. Um, this functioned on through World War II, for, through World War One, and Nicholas wrote a crest of popular patriotism for the Tsar, church, country, at the outbreak of the war, but he was faced with crushing defeats by the Germans and food shortages and a shattered economy until finally the people blamed him for World War One, even though you know, it was the Germans that attacked them, and the people deposed him in 1917. The October Revolution. The Germans reacted to the provisional government's decision to continue the war by supplying the Bolsheviks with huge sums of cash and by secretly conveying the exiled Lenin from Switzerland to Russia. So Lenin was born Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. He was a brilliant student of Marxism and he began to see himself as the prophet of the communist revolution. After further military defeat, the provisional government began to lose favor of the people. The Bolsheviks seized power using their parliamentary force, the Red Guard. Lenin and Trotsky came to the forefront of the revolution as the new leaders of Russia. When Lenin allowed the people to go to the polls, they voted overwhelmingly against the Bolsheviks and gave the communists only one quarter of the seats in the constituent assembly. Lenin's solution was to declare the election was not valid because it had occurred too soon after the revolution to be meaningful. He forcefully cleared the assembly with the aid of Bolshevik soldiers. And for the next three years, civil wars raged between the white Russians and the red Russians, the whites and the reds. Uh, Leon Trotsky's Red Army put an end to all uprisings by 1920 and a communist dictatorship began. So they started with elections, they didn't get all the power, so they seized it in a series of civil wars. Lenin began a long-standing policy of the Soviet Union, hostility towards all forms of Christianity. In the early years after the revolution, it was the Orthodox Church that suffered the full brunt of the persecution. Protestant churches, ironically, enjoyed some comparative freedom and they took full, full advantage. So there were some like German Lutherans and there were some pietistic groups in Russia as well. And it didn't last long, though, for them to be persecuted, too. The Reign of Terror. The bloodiest reign of terror in modern history, which surpassed Hitler's attempted genocide of the Jews, was the iron-fisted rulership of Joseph Stalin. And I have to qualify that. Um, Mao and China and Pol Pot and uh, Indochina were obviously um, just as cruel, if not crueler. But Joseph Stalin, in my opinion, um, you know, it was really something to behold. As far as, as far as someone that persecuted Christianity, Stalin was it. Okay. During the 1930s and 40s, millions of people were killed in Stalin's Persian purges, and many of these people were Christians. All right. Uh, then the then World War II abruptly changed the situation, exploiting the Russian nationalism of the Orthodox Church. Concessions were made between Stalin and Christian leaders, so there was a relaxation of oppression. And there was a type of a spiritual revival in the Soviet Union during the war. So, ironically, this is an atheistic society, but then there are a lot of people who turn to God during World War II. Post-war Russia, this relative freedom did not last for long. Nikita Khrushchev came to power in the 1950s. Khrushchev unleashed a vicious attack against the church, which lasted until his fall from power in 1964. Half the Orthodox churches in the country were closed during this time, and also the Baptist and Pentecostal churches suffered as well. Um, so there was this militantly atheistic policy that affected all the churches of the Soviet Union. 
The communist policy toward the church has swung between violent persecution and then subtle propaganda, but at no time has the Communist Party officially abandoned its declared aim of destroying Christianity. In the midst of these persecutions, there have appeared a group of vocal Christian dissidents within the Soviet Union who have kept up the prophetic tradition of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky in calling their nation back to God. The most notable among these Soviet dissidents is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn, author of the Gulag Archipelago, for which he won the Nobel Prize, is a narrative which describes his imprisonment under Stalin. He's also compiled a collection of essays written by some of the Soviet Union's most brilliant thinkers, the majority of whom also happen to be Christians. So these are like little um, essays by dissidents during the time of the Soviet Union that Solzhenitsyn collected later on. It's translated into English and the book is called From Under the Rubble. Okay. And this first quote here is by just a man called A.B., The Direction of Change. Mysteriously and unsuspected by the busy multitudes, Christian consciousness, once almost defunct, is stealing back. It is as if a door had opened while nobody was looking. Why is this rebirth taking place in our country where Christianity is attacked, particularly systematically and with great brutality, while the rest of the world suffers a decline of faith and religious feeling. Backsliding and denial is notwithstanding, we live in a Christian culture, in a Christian age, and it is Christianity that is the fermenting agent, the yeast of the world, causing history to rise like dough in a trough, not only in the past, but in the future as well. We are profoundly convinced that Christianity alone possesses enough motive force to gradually and inspire the world. Okay, and then the second quote here is from Vadim Borisov, Personality and National Awareness. We discover with astonishment that so-called rationalist humanism actually lacks an adequate rational basis for its defense of the dignity and the inalienable rights of the human personality, for which it has often risked both life and limb. The American founding fathers who many years ago first propounded the eternal rights of man and the citizen postulated that every human being bears the form and likeness of God. He therefore has an absolute value and consequently also the right to be respected by his fellows. Rationalism, positivism, and materialism successively destroyed the memory of this absolute source of human rights. The unconditional equality of persons before God was replaced by the conditional equality of human individuals before the law. So despite the Marxist mandate to sweep aside the principles of Christianity, the strength of Christianity continued to grow behind the Iron Curtain. The principles of communism, which were cultivated in the Soviet Union for nearly a century, never achieved the utopia which Marx foresaw. Instead, the predictions of Russia's prophets are now beginning to come to pass. From under the rubble means that from under the rubble of a fallen system, there is now arising a new hope. Communism's downfall has been precipitated by the presence of an overcoming church, which has withstood all persecution and has now been vindicated by the God of history. In its very breakup, the pieces, the rubble, provided the space for this underground Christian movement to arise. So the period that we're in now is called the second Christianization of Russia. And I've spent several months of my life in Russia and Ukraine. And we encountered a growing spiritual fervor among the people. Uh, there is an almost complete rejection of Marxist-Leninism among the people, especially the young people. Uh, people that believe that communism can come back in the Soviet Union, they just don't really know Russia. There are communists in Russia today, but they're mostly older people who don't see any other choice. But there's this rejection of Marxism and then the loosening of the shackles of restraint on religious freedom. So it's unclear at this point what's going to happen. There have been various laws passed in the Russian Duma, which were initially used to restrict dangerous cults. There was actually a suicide cult, for instance, um, back in the time of the 90s, and they began to progressively restrict the power of uh, foreign missionaries and so on. 
But I believe that there's a spiritual force. It's unleashed and it's eventually going to transform this nation. So it's been over a thousand years since the first Christianization of Russia. And that consisted of a forced baptism of Vladimir's subjects in the river Dnieper. And for the first time in history, we see this hope, a spiritual awakening that would spread through the fabric of Russian society. Today, more evangelicals exist in Russia than in any other country in Europe. And the second most evangelicals and the largest percentage of evangelicals is in Ukraine. So all of this shaking and turmoil that's making the daily news is an indication of what's happening in the spiritual world. We must remember that God and not man is in control of Russia and Ukraine and all the nations of the former Soviet Union.